Okay, and welcome to a cast for crows. Uh, we will be talking about episode two, A House of Black and White. My name is Drew Maroon. I'm Alexa rahman -Brust. And I am Joe Ballard, avid book reader and show watcher. All right, so uh, let's just jump right into this. I think the first thing we wanted to talk about was Arya's arrival at uh, Bravos. Yeah. Yes, we did. Um, yeah, we finally got to see where Arya went after the end of season four. And, yeah, she finally pulled up to the House of Black and White where a, a black man suddenly um, appeared at the door and turned her away. And I was curious what you guys made of the whole um, the man revealing himself to be Jack and Hagar. So, I, go ahead. <laughs> I talked about this with Joe. I, like, figured the second that they opened the door, I was like, that's Jack and Hagar. And, like, when he turned her away, I was like, this is a test. So I, I wasn't all that surprised, but it was still great to see him. I don't know what you thought, Andy. So I didn't know it was Jack and I just thought it was, like, some guy. I actually didn't know. But I was, I felt like it was pretty clear that it was a test or, like, they weren't going to be like, oh, no, that's not here. Go away. And then she was just going to, like, leave. Like, they spent too much time building up to that. <laughs> that happened. Sorry. Yeah, so I figured it was some sort of test, but I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought the reveal at the end was, like, a little too cheesy for my liking. <laughs> but I don't know enough about, like, who he is as being, like, the world's most novice show watcher. Like, I just don't, I don't know how important that was, or if that was supposed to be like, whoa, that was cool. But I thought it was kind of cheesy. Yeah, Maybe I mean, because I... I was researching stuff on Mission Impossible, and I remembered Mission Impossible too, and it just kind of made me angry. <laughs> no, I mean, when I saw it, like my friend, my friend and I laughed because he like literally like was like, ha, oh, new face. Yeah, and it wasn't <laughs> even like. It's one thing if you, like, actually took it off, but then they did the camera behind her head, and it was just, like, a little too cheesy for me. <laughs> but then it was, like, over real quick, and it was like, cool, let's move on with this storyline. I want to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I was I was definitely excited that they revealed it was Jacques and Hagar. I really wasn't that surprised, but I was like, yes, he's back. I'm so excited, because I just, I loved his character. Like, he was barely in it, but he was just such a badass. Yeah. I was just excited to see Ari again. Like, I don't know. I just like her storyline. That's one of my favorite storylines. And so, yeah, it was a big tease, I felt, this episode. Like, they bookend the whole episode uh, with it, but it, we didn't really get much out of it. You know, but it's just like, I'm like, all right, let's go. I want to see you. I, wanna, I want this right. to go. I feel like it was like that for the whole episode. It was kind of just setting everything up. But yeah. You I know, agree. the whole episode itself was kind of slow to me. Yeah. Joe and I were talking about it. It's a little like, slow. This is one of those, like, the show itself is a lot of, like, talking and sort of moving forward through dialogue and not necessarily action and stuff. But something about this episode felt, like, particularly slow. And, you know, I did not like it. I just kept waiting for something. And even, like, I know we'll get to this later, but even the whole Jon Snow as the Lord Commander thing was kind of like, all right. And then the Brienne sort of fight thing was like, all right. I don't know. I, some, something about this episode felt slightly odd to me. Just, like, a little too slow yeah, I mean, it was a lot of setup material. Um, you know, a couple of things even felt, like, a little pointless almost. Like, mm -hmm. Tyrion and Varys are basically yeah. just... They're just sitting in the carriage talking, and that was all that happened. Yeah. And I remember telling... I told you guys last week that I expected we would see Illyrio Mopatis this week, and that didn't happen, obviously. So I was a little disappointed with that. Um mm -hmm. But yeah, as far as Jacken, um, it makes you wonder though, like who is he really? Because you know, is is Jacken's face that is that his true identity, or is that also a mask for someone else? You know, we have no idea. But I yeah. doubt he, I doubt he's actually Jacken Hagar. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think that was mostly just to to show her, like it's me. That's the face you know. Yeah. I, I sincerely doubt that's his like actual face. I don't think he would be so careless about showing it around like that. It's one of those characters that I think has so much more behind it and then, you know, it's just being a show watcher, it's like they give you like this little much, but you can tell there's like all this other information that is available to know. 
and I'm you know I might be wrong. Like maybe the people who read the books have no idea about him also. But I just feel like he's really mysterious, and we know like I know nothing about him. Yeah. I mean, like almost nothing except I, I think whatever he's going to be involved with is going to be interesting. Yeah, I, I can I can tell you we know even less about him in the books because he okay. hasn't uh, he hasn't reappeared yet. So that's something that they changed for the show, and I I think that's a cool change. I like it. Okay, so he hasn't come back in the books books yet. You said, but does she still no, go to this, Does she still go to this house of black and white, or is this all new territory for you? Yes, yeah, she does go to the house of black and white, and um. The the man who answered the door, well, obviously it's Jackin, but um, he's just known in the books as the kindly man, okay. and he's just kind of an elderly man who acts as a mentor for her. Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, obviously we know now that they're going to have Jackin assume that role instead, which you okay. know, I think that's so. I think that's totally fine. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great because she's already connected with him, so so it would like build that bond faster. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right, so we want to talk now about the Sansa and Littlefinger uh, conversation in the, I don't know what you'd call it, the bar, the pub, where uh, Brienne and Podrick were. Yeah, I think um, it was, I, it's funny, they misled me last week because I assumed they were going in opposite directions, yeah. those two parties, mm-hmm. and so to suddenly see them turn up and... Uh, Podrick, right, was like all of a sudden, uh, my lady, Sansa Stark, Lord Baelish, right there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I guess how it played out um, didn't really surprise me. What interests me the most is that Brienne's storyline has just gone so far off from the books now. And I can only uh, say well done to the showrunners because it's actually interesting now. Like, she's <laughs> found both Sansa and Arya and yet neither, they both choose not to go with her. Like, mm-hmm. no one forced them to, you know. It's not like they were held captive. They both consciously made the decision that they didn't want to go with her, which, um, you know, it's more it's more interesting that way, but it has to be so frustrating for Brienne because, like, nothing goes right for this poor woman. Yeah. This has, like, been her, her goals for God knows how long. She And basically she fails everyone, which... It's kind of sad to say, but I mean, she failed Renly, she failed um, Lady Stark, yeah, found Arya, and she was like, no. And then Sansa was like, yeah, I don't trust you. So like now she's basically has no purpose other than trying to get Sansa, but that's not going to work out very well. Yeah, I didn't even. I thought it was really interesting when uh, Littlefinger was saying all that. You know, like you're big and you're tough, but you kind of suck at doing your job, basically. <laughs> I thought that because you know I, I didn't think of her that way, and he just put it yeah, really no. bluntly, and I was like, oh, I guess she so does kind of. Everyone suck. dies. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but you know, I didn't get the vibe that she was gonna go try and sort of steal Sansa away again after the whole thing. I kind of just got the vibe that she was gonna sulk behind him and make sure nothing happened to her, and then like step in yeah. when something, you know, inevitably happens, but. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like Podrick as a character. I feel like he's kind of teetering on this, like, almost too annoyingly helpless area. I kind of felt yeah, like, I mean, you know, he's, he's thrown off the horse, and then he's throwing the rock around. He's just kind of like, I don't know, he's being a dork. But yeah. <laughs> normally I really I mean, like he's, like he's, like, purely comic relief at this point. Yeah, which I felt like he was in a good sort of middle ground before, especially, like, even at the beginning of the scene, you know, he's really intelligent. He's like, oh, that's them. Like, you know, there's just many guards there. You probably shouldn't do this. Like, he knew what was going on, and then he, like, gets on a horse and he just come, becomes oh. useless. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know. I, I was with Joe. I didn't think they were going the same area, so that sort of surprised me, too. But I got to tell you, I get a little bit of, like, anxiety every time their storyline comes on because you told me that that's kind of all new ground for you. It's like every time I watch them, I just kind of get a little worried for you. <laughs> yeah, see, what's so interesting now, um, like I told you last week, I was 
feeling nervous because her storyline had gone past the books, but mm-hmm. this this week I'm not nearly as nervous. And the reason is because um, in the books, Brienne's storyline doesn't um, it doesn't connect with Sansa's at all, and you know that shows us book readers that Sansa's storyline in the show is like almost completely different from what it's going to be in the books. Okay. So now there's definitely less um, nervousness for me, and I'm just kind of enjoying watching how it's how it's going to play out in this medium, knowing I'll be reading something different uh, mm-hmm. later on. Mm-hmm. So, sort of to touch on that a little bit, what you're saying is, you know, in the book she's going sort of one direction with her storyline, in the show she's kind of essentially going entirely different, at least at this point, or it seems that way. So Yes, yes. Do you think that they might both end up at, like, the same places? So say, you know, the whole point is this thing happens at the end and, you know, nobody knows what it is yet, but do you think maybe both mediums go in different directions but end up at the same, like, end point? Or do you think they're just going entirely different ways? Oh, boy, that's a very good question. I would say, in general, I think most of them will end up in the same places at the end. But, um, you know, as far as actually getting there... Um, I expect it'll be completely different from the books. Um, you know, I can't... I don't want to say too much about the differences in Brienne's storyline just because what does eventually... what she does eventually run into may still happen in the show. But, um, but yeah, I think in general, most of them will probably end up in the same place. But, you know, the show being the show, I'm sure they'll um, kill off a few characters to mm-hmm. shock us who will otherwise stay alive in the books. Okay. Mm-hmm. Huh. I was thinking about that the other day. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of relatively big things that are really changing, and I feel I think I'd be surprised if they like just ended entirely differently than the than the books. Like I just have this feeling that they kind of want some of that continuity continuity because it's, you know, it's one thing for them to kind of go different ways, but I don't know. That'll just be interesting for the book readers to see how that sort of plays out. And at least it gives you guys some uncharted ground to experience the show a little bit on our, our level. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. And it's the same with um, Jamie Lannister going to Dorne as well. Mm-hmm. That, that does mm-hmm. not happen in the books either. So that's, um, you know, it's completely new direction. So, you know, I'm just... It's not, it's not a spoiler in any way, so I'm just having fun enjoying mm-hmm. it as a show watcher like you guys are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, sort of jumping in on that, you know, I, I really liked that scene between Cersei and, and Jamie. I thought it was uh, a good... I, I just liked the scene. I liked the, the whole way it played out. And then right at the very end when he was like, who said I was going alone? I was like, I know exactly who he's talking about. <laughs> I'm stoked because I like him as a character too. I think Bronn is interesting. Like he's... I don't know. I felt like I had been missing Braun for a while. And yeah. It was funny to see him in that situation, you know, wearing the nice clothes, talking with the, you know, his betrothed about what their wedding would be like or whatever. And then he's like, he just seemed uncomfortable and out of place. <laughs> he seemed kind of annoyed that Jamie was there, but at the same time, I was like, he's super stoked he's there because that means he gets to leave and go do something. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it just seems really out of place. And then him just listening to that girl talk on and on, he was just like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, end this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's such a great character because he brings that comic relief that we need, but he's also very clever. You know, yeah. he's that's, – that's what made him and Tyrion such a great pair was that they were – you know, he matched Tyrion's cleverness. Yeah. Which almost no character does. And um, but yeah, I just love when uh, when they're walking and all of a sudden they sh- they cut to Jamie sitting there and uh, Lawless Stokeworth goes, "Who's that?" And he goes, yeah. "It's Jamie fucking Lannister." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I, I yeah, I don't know. I really like that. Um, so you're saying in the books it sort of doesn't play out that same way? No, Bron um Bron actually settles into his life. Um, very differently with Wallace Stokeworth, 
And Jamie doesn't go to Dorne at all. That never happens. He goes somewhere else. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if, because uh, we know how pissed off Dorne is, rightfully mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if both of them, both Jamie and Bronn, can get out of Dorne unscathed. Mm -hmm. I have, mm -hmm. I yeah. honestly have no idea. So. So, speaking of, we sort of got our first little tiny taste of Dorne, you know, as, as a, a location and as a sort of a people. Uh, I felt like it was really quick. Yeah. You know, they just showed the little uh, garden scene with uh, the little Lannister girl, whatever her name is. <laughs> Marcella. Marcella. <laughs> uh, and I guess the <laughs> prince, Prince Doran. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then who was the other person in, involved? That was that, Elia Sand, right? That was Ilaria Sand, Prince Oberyn's... Ilaria uh, Sand. That was Oberyn's paramour. She has a new hairstyle and a very different attitude now, but yes, that was her. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm glad we finally got to see that. I was, we didn't see Dorne in, like, the opening credits, right? Yeah, no, I, was, I was We didn't. Was that was so weird. Yeah, because I've been waiting, you know, for the first episode and through this one, I was just waiting to see it, because everybody sort of built Dorn up. I was like, I want to see what it looks like. And I didn't show it. And the first thing I said once the you know, opening credits stopped, I was like, well, maybe next week. I guess we'll see it then. <laughs> well, so. Andy, if you really feel better, it looks like Spain, because it's in Spain. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, we got a tiny little glimpse of it. You know, she brought up the sand snakes. I, I don't know what the mm -hmm. sand snakes are, you know. <laughs> so, they set the groundwork for a lot of stuff, but yeah, well, I I liked um, how in the preview, like previously on Game of Thrones, they show like Oberyn talking to Cersei, like we don't hurt girl little girls in Dorne, and then like D Prince Doran seems to be thinking the same thing, like mm -hmm. we're not gonna hurt her, like just because, and like he's pretty rational about it. He was like, look, like it wasn't murder, it was like a trial by combat, like yeah. he lost. And then like Alaria stands like, no, we're gonna we're gonna do stuff. Yeah, one thing both of you guys need to know is that all of Dorne uh, supports Ilaria's view in that. Like, they want war okay. against the Lannisters and okay. against yeah, I mean, the wasn't, throne. Yeah, like, wasn't Oberyn just really beloved by, like, everyone? Yeah, he was. And, and you know, Prince, Dor Prince Doran is very well loved, too. But, um, but yeah, he's, he's very much the opposite of Oberyn in almost every single way. Because you could already see, you know, he's he's much calmer under pressure. He's uh, much more calculating, I guess. He mm -hmm. really um, he really takes his time, thinks things through, and um, yeah, it was interesting seeing Ilaria so just you know very very different from last season, and um, but yeah, you're gonna see. I it's so weird because they're changing it so much from the books because. When they introduce Dorne in book four, there's enough characters to make a whole another cast just mm -hmm. just of just of Dornish folks. Hmm. So um, it seems like they're really going to play up Elaria Sand's role in the show. And um, yeah, I hope hopefully we'll see the the Sand Snakes next week. And I think Andy it's just to come in next week. Yeah, I was going to say. So without spoiling stuff, it sounds like the Sand Snakes are just some like top tier fighter like sort of people, but I have no idea. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll just go ahead and tell you, since you're going to find out soon anyway, the Sand Snakes are three of Prince Oberyn's daughters. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they're just, like, I've seen, like, little previews of, like, introductions of them. They're just really badass, and... They're, they're very they much like Oberyn. Okay. Yeah. Huh. I don't know, I... Yeah. I think, sort of going off what you were saying, it, it sounds like Dorne has a lot of sort of history and lore behind it, and I... We've seen a lot of the same sort of places, and it's not like those places aren't interesting, but I really want to see and learn about a new place. And, you know, everybody's been talking about Dorne, so I'm just ready for somebody to go there and start doing some stuff so I can start sort of watching a new place, I guess. Yeah, they've been building up Thorn for God knows how long. Yeah. And it's just like, 
basically what we've gotten from is it's really foreign and everyone's really different from the like they are in Westeros or well whatever King's Landing. Mm -hmm. so. Well, to give you a little bit of history without spoiling anything, I can tell you that ever since the Targaryens ruled Westeros hundreds hundreds of years ago, um, Dorne was the only they never actually pledged fealty to the Targaryens, and just like they never really pledged fealty to King Robert either. Mm -hmm. But um, the point is that no one ever really has made them bend the knee. But they got along with most of the Targaryen kings, and um, mm -hmm. so you know they were content to, you know, um, live under their rule. But then, you know, after that, obviously they had to. They were not happy when you know. During Robert's Rebellion, they killed um, Princess Elia and, mm -hmm. you know, her and Rhaegar's children and all that. And so that's kind of where the buildup has come from. Like, you get the sense that they've been, they've been waiting for their moment to strike all this time. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what, I guess, yeah, you, you, we do know that because of uh, Prince Oberyn last season. But yeah. um, Prince, Prince Doran, the actual ruler of Doran, is... Um, you know, he's very, very different, and he definitely will not um, take any of the same decisions that Oberyn would have done and did. Hmm. So, uh, so yeah, you guys are going to get, you guys should get some very interesting history coming up soon. And, um, yeah, Prince Doran, he may not look like much, but he is extremely freaking clever in his own way, I promise. So, no, I got that. Is he in a wheelchair? Yes, he is. Or is he, uh, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's gout. Okay. It's, that, that's what. That's his problem. That's his problem is gout, and um, he basically it's affected his legs and his knees so much that he can't really walk anymore. Yeah. Okay, because they like you know they showed sort of a, a wider shot of him and he was in a chair, and it had wheels on it, but I couldn't tell if it was a wheelchair. I don't know. I didn't know if it was like a style thing, and then. They didn't spend a lot of time on him. You know, it was a very quick scene. I bet you it wasn't more than like. I didn't even know it was to two be honest. Minutes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was a little disappointed in that scene just because it was so short. And um, not only did we not learn much about Prince Doran, but they only showed Marcella, and that was his. That was Prince Doran's son Tristane with <laughs> Marcella, but they didn't. They didn't even, like, we didn't get to hear them talk, you know? We just heard mm -hmm. them, or we just saw them from afar, I guess. Yeah. And I was I hoping for a little bit more in that scene, but... Yeah, I kind of felt like they missed out on, like, a cool grand entrance for Dorne. Like, I felt it was, oh, look, here it is, here's a little bit, and they got out of there. Like, I felt like they could have done, like, a more grand entrance to sort of show off Dorne as a location, but maybe that comes later. Maybe they needed to do this for the sake of sort of pushing the story along. At least, you know, relating to Cersei and the, getting the locket back. I don't know. Um, so, just to clarify, the Prince of Dorne is Doran. <laughs> yes, that's correct. O mm -hmm. Oberyn, Oberyn, Oberyn was his brother. Yeah, Dorne well, and Doran. confusing or anything. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know. Sauron and well, Sauron. Well, at least you'll know. Yeah. <laughs> at least you'll know it's Doran from Doran. Yeah, that's true. I'm not going to forget where You're he's from. You're never going to mess up. <laughs> um, so at the end of the first episode, Jon Snow sort of put Vance out of his misery. Mance. Mance, yes. And I was <laughs> sitting there waiting for him to get in trouble. That's like I just felt like he was in big trouble right afterwards. And it turns out that he wasn't in much trouble. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that was um, that was an interesting way for Stannis to go about it, especially as they showed uh, Ser Davos showing John his fingers, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I was very curious. What did you guys make of Stannis offering? To not only legitimize John as John Stark, but also give him Winterfell and basically rally the North around him. What did so, you guys make of his decision to turn that down? You know, I'm assuming in the books there's like a much more detailed backstory that shows John being like really maybe really attached to Winterfell or something. 
but from the show, it was like I in, like I I didn't even think that he was gonna accept it. Like I knew he was just gonna say no because, you know, he was only in Winterfell for a little bit for the sake of the show, and it's not like he talked about it or sort of reflected on it very much. So then he seemed very committed. He's always like, I'm you know I'm a crow. I'm here at the wall, sort of thing. And so it seemed like instantly, I did, I, like I didn't think he'd accept it at all. I was, you know, kind of disappointed that Stannis was like, yeah, I, you know, I don't tolerate that, but don't worry about it. And then he like gave him this like mm. great offer. I just thought it was really out of nowhere. Like I did not see that coming, but I really expected that he was going to turn it down. Like I, I wasn't very surprised. Yeah, no, I wasn't really surprised so much either. I think more than anything, it was just him finally being able to call himself Stark, which mm-hmm. is something that, you know, he, he doesn't necessarily say, but you can tell that he really wants that. He yeah, like, wants to belong. Yeah, you know, because I, I, I think when he was telling John sort of like the order of what he'd get, like I think he said, I'll give you Winterfell, blah, 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 blah. You can basically call yourself John Stark. Like in that last part was what really made him think about it. Like, it's just sort of the way he they played out that scene, I felt. Like, he yeah. didn't really care about that other stuff until they were like, yeah, you, you won't be a Snow, you'll be a Stark. And then he was like, oh. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. No, but I, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think John's stupid. I think he knows that the only reason Stan's is offering him all of that is so that he could, like, have the allegiance of the North on his side. And he was mm-hmm. just like, uh... Like, I want to be a Stark, but I don't want it that badly. Yeah. That's true, but you also have to think about the fact, like, I w- like you know, for me, I was disappointed in that scene, mainly because you're, what you were saying was exactly right, Andy. Mm-hmm. That's that um, John still very much has a connection to Winterfell and to his brothers and sisters, and... Um, you know, when in the show, when Stannis made him the offer, he thought about it for all of two seconds, yeah. and that was it. Whereas in the books, he thought about it, like, good and hard. And I, I the first time I read through that part, I actually thought he was going to take the offer. Uh-huh. I really did. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, in the show, it was just like they rushed it so fast. Mm-hmm. And, you know... They they had John thinking about everything like um like Stannis talked to him about the possibility of avenging Rob, avenging his father, um you know avenging Arya who's they believe is dead and Sansa, who's nowhere to be found in their eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I was just like it, it's clear in the books that Stannis values John very much and I don't feel like they did a great job of showing that um on screen. I don't mm-hmm. know. It, it yeah. all felt so rushed, and then immediately they moved on to the whole Lord Commander election thing. Mm-hmm. See, the, the way I saw it is, it, it kind of, to me, seemed like John, it, it goes to show like how honorable of a character he is, and I think, you know, with Ned Stark being viewed as one of the most honorable men of like all of Westeros, it was just like showing the family character trait. Mm-hmm. That's how I took it as it being something where he was like, okay, this is what I want. This is what's for the best. Mm-hmm. He's very much an honorable p- character. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is one of those things, and it hasn't happened a lot in the show, honestly, but it's one of the few times where you're like, okay, I really get that there's probably a lot more to this that we're maybe missing. Like, it. it sometimes you see books that are you know, turned into movies and you really feel like there's a lot of stuff here that we're missing because they're trying to fit it in a two-hour movie. And I kind mm-hmm. of felt like that with this scene. Mm-hmm. Um, it did feel a little rushed in that it was supposed to be, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it was more grand than it actually was displayed, but it just didn't translate as well to their their format. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. But, you know, and again, Game of Thrones is not usually very uh, predictable. <laughs> but right when they started doing the, uh, you know, the voting, before they even started talking about it, basically, like, we're going to go vote now. I was like, John's going to win somehow. You know. But mm-hmm. I, I, I did like uh, the whole thing when What's-His-Name was speaking up and John was looking at him like, you better shut your mouth right now. Like, yeah. stop doing this. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I like that whole thing. But, you know, I don't know, again, as being more of a novice, I don't know how, like, significant that is. I know the Lord Commander is usually, like, a older, sort of higher-ranking position, but it kind of felt not super, like... Grand. I don't know what it was about that whole scene, but like I feel like it was supposed to be a bigger deal than it actually was. I you know, I like. Go ahead. I was just gonna say they again they spent a lot of time building up to not just John thinking over Stannis's offer, but they also spent a lot of time building up to that election. Like mm-hmm. it went on for it went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and um, mm-hmm. you know they. To win the election in the books, you had to get something like 65 to 70% of all the votes. And each time they voted, none of the candidates got that much. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. um, it like dragged on and on. And um, Sam Tarley was working behind the scenes to get John more votes. But um, always in the background, Stennis was watching them, and he was basically getting annoyed. Like, you know, you, like, you guys need to get on with this and elect a Lord Commander. Mm-hmm. But the point is, mm-hmm. it really built. It really built up to the point where it felt like it was like, oh yeah, that's awesome. John's the Lord Commander now, and mm-hmm. um, I, yeah, I agree with Andy. They didn't do a great job of um, showing that significance, but I promise you, it is extremely significant mm-hmm. from this point forward. Yeah, no, I I agree. It was really rushed. Um, but I, I did like how, like, when Sam's kind of reading through history, he's like, oh, yeah, the, longest, the youngest Lord Commander was, like, 10 or something is what he said. Is that, am I correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's, like, not, so it's, like, not just, like, John's not, like, the youngest Lord Commander ever, and, like, there have been young Lord Commanders. So I liked how they kind of were, like, hinting at it in that way. So it's not like, oh, it's just an old guy. But, mm-hmm. it, I mean, I agree. It was really rushed. And I thought it was really cheesy when they had, um, I don't remember his name. I know he's a Targaryen. Um, Maester the, Aemon? The, the old guy. And I, just when he just kind of like, it was like, oh, it's a tie. Let me just, ah, here we go. All better. And yeah. I was like, that was so cheesy. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> but I can see how it, it it's significant, so... My main thought of that is it seemed like those were two pretty big points in sort of his tie in his storyline. But that just makes me think that they're gonna do another episode that's like one location, one place, sort of one battle. And now I feel like it's gonna be John having a battle somewhere again because they it seemed like they kinda rushed two points. Which mm-hmm. means at some point in the future I think he's gonna be, you know, again in the episode long, you know, cool battle thing. So mm-hmm. that was that was just sort of my vibe from it, and that's more of a, you know, understanding how they've done the show in the past sort of thing. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So I think one of the last things we would talk about is Daenerys and, and what's going on over with her. Uh, so they found a son of the Harpy, yes. Yeah. And she was trying to figure out what to do with him. And... Basically, she was like, all right, you know, we'll give him fair trial, fine. And then one of her, like, I don't know what he was technically, like one of her council members or, you know, something like that, one of her advisors, mm-hmm. sort of didn't like the way he was being talked to, I guess, and sort of, you know, killed him and nailed him to a wall or, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, with the, with the son of the harpy, you know, it was, cause I, I'm, I believe he was one of the slaves, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, so with that, I think he would just felt threatened that mm-hmm. you know he was gonna be put back into slavery and that all that they've worked for has been for nothing. So he he you know, you know he basically executed the guy, and that resulted in Daenerys, which I, I'm gonna say I personally agreed with it, and I thought it was like I would have probably done the exact same thing um, to just show a message to people like we're not like them like. Mm-hmm. We have to like we like just because they've been bad to us, like we still have to follow the laws. So when mm-hmm. she when she like when he came in and she was like they're like, let's figure something out, like what are we gonna do about this? So I was like, she's gonna execute him. Like she has to. Mm-hmm. See the difference here is I mean, this everything that happened with Daenerys in yesterday's episode was completely different from the books, but I I won't even go into that. 
I think what this mm-hmm. was meant to sh- this what this was meant to show was that like I was telling Alexa that um, Daenerys making the decision to execute um, that council member kind of called to mind when Rob Stark um, beheaded mm-hmm. uh, Lord Rickard Karstark for killing the Lannister prisoners, those mm-hmm. two boys. Mm-hmm. And um, I felt like it kind of had, it kind of felt just like that. But the difference, the major difference here is that we have to remember, Meereen is not Westeros. They don't operate on Westeros laws at all. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. She, she's basically trying to implement an entirely new set of laws. And they're not, you know, as we saw, the, the Miranese people are not receptive to it at all. So that's mm-hmm. you know yeah. that's a that's a major problem for her because it almost felt like a lose lose situation. Yeah, I mean it got really chaotic following that event, and you know they're calling her Misa, and out of nowhere there's you know it happens, and the guy's saying like Misa, please like don't do this, like forgive me, and she's just like no, like justice has to be served, and mm-hmm. out of nowhere they just start hissing at her, and she loses all control, and it kind of felt like the scene where like. Joffrey went out and people started throwing shit at him, like, mm-hmm. like they were just throwing stuff at her, and it, she basically lost control at that point, and it's kind of all falling apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I I tend to agree with she did probably what I would have suggested that she do, but at the same time, sort of taking a step back, like Joe said, they don't operate the same way. So like, mm-hmm. I would have instinctively been like, yeah, you know. We're going to follow this set of rules, regardless of where you are, or, you know, what s- social standing you are, you're going to follow- adhere to the same set of rules. But then, like, it's just a very clear divide between the yeah. groups of people there. Like, and I think they did a great job of having the Unsullied sort of stand, you know, back-to-back and, you know, basically break it up like a little wall, you know, with one of them on one side and one on the other. It's like, at that point even doing the right thing gave sort of the wrong outcome, I guess. Yeah, so like, I don't know what I would have done, really you know, looking back on it. Because beforehand, I was like, yeah, just do, go through the same thing. He did that. You know, you got to chop his head off. Like, it's just, just the, them's the rules. But mm-hmm. it's much more complicated than that. I don't, I don't know what the right thing should have been. You know, I, I, I like that scene. I, I thought it was well done. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I agree. I think I would have done the same thing. It's yeah. just, it's the logical response. It's, you kill someone, we kill you, like, mm-hmm. you gotta keep order and things, like, and she did it in front of everyone, you know, send a message. Mm-hmm. This is what, this is the law, this is how it's going to be, like, you can't just kill people willy-nilly, like, uh, like, I understand you guys are, like, frustrated, but we can't just kill people like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah what do we, we really just think? Go ahead. I was going to say, one scene um, that tied in with that that I really liked was when Ser Barristan was giving her counsel, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was significant because I believe, to my knowledge in the show, that was the first time someone had told Daenerys the truth about what her father was really like. Yeah. And, um, like, you know, she had grown up with Viserys, thinking that, you know, Oh, so rumors are oh, it's exaggerated and whatnot. But um, but yeah, Sir Barristan came right out and just told her, you know, this is this is what your father did. He did it to feel it made him feel powerful, but it also made the people rise up against him. And um, yeah, I thought it was terrific that she finally found out um, a few hard yeah. truths about her father, and that Barristan was able to give her some good counsel on that. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. I mean it. It clearly struck a chord with her. She instantly was like, "Well, I'm not my father." Mm-hmm. So that instantly like influenced her decision with the son of the harpy. Um, but yeah, it'll be real interesting to see what happens with her. Her storyline, I think we talked about this briefly last week, was kind of straightforward and successful for a long time, and she's really getting to like a big mess now. And it's not yeah, like it's, it's gotten any clearer. Yeah. No, I. That that's brings us to the next topic I want to talk about specifically. Um, so Drogon reappears, and we're like, hell yeah, like Drogon's back. And so in that instant, you're like, okay, well, she might not be like their Misa anymore, but she's still the mother of dragons. Mm-hmm. And so she she reaches out to Drogon, and I think he, like, yells in her face and then just kind of, like, flies away. So, mm-hmm. like, that to me symbolized just 
everything's falling apart. Like, you're not these people like Misa anymore, and, like, you're not the mother of dragons. And those were, like, the things that were, like, you know, it was her, her yeah. thing. Daenerys yeah. was, like, the mother of everyone, and now she's basically lost all of her figurative children. So it's just kind of, to me, it's just everything's falling apart. Like, she can't even be what she has been for the past couple of years. She Like, her dragons yeah. don't even want her. Yeah, especially if you throw in that scene last week where she sort of went to go see how the dragons were doing, mm-hmm. and having none of it, you know. I think that falls right in line with, with what you're saying. She's sort of losing control of, of sort of all of it and all the things that made up her identity. Yeah, no, and I mean, and like part of it is like Daenerys, what she had as her one-up on everyone is she was like, I have all these people and I have my dragons. So like right now without her dragons and without all these people, like she's just a little girl with an army. She like, mm-hmm. doesn't really have a one up. That's like that was her that was her one up for sure. So mm-hmm. she's basically losing all of that. So it's just and you see how like it tore her apart to see that she was just losing everything. Yeah. Um that, I really I'm, like I'm gonna, that scene. I'm gonna throw out something completely different here. Um Drogon's reappearance uh in the books did not happen until much, much later. And uh, there's a very good reason for that. But as far as this, I took it as... I didn't take it as him abandoning her so much as his appearance was kind of a symbol to almost like a remember who you are type of deal. And the reason I say that is because why why would Drogon come back to her then? You know, he could... If he had really abandoned her, he could have just gone off anywhere. He could have been in Westeros by now, for all we know. Mm-hmm. Or he could have been just about, you know, anywhere doing whatever he wanted. But I think the fact that he still came back to her and, you know, he, he can go around breathing fire, killing anyone or anything he wants. He didn't kill her. He didn't even do anything to try and harm her. He just kind of, you know, he roared at her a little bit and then he flew back off. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me personally, I take that more as a symbol of some kind of symbol to remember who she is and not, you know, things are going badly for her. She's losing control a little bit, but she needs to remember that she has the blood of the dragon. She is the mother of those dragons and that, mm-hmm. you know, she, you know, she's a Targaryen. She's a ruler. She's a queen. She has to figure out a way to keep control of this. So I, yeah, I mean, I, you guys make very good points and I talked about this with Alexa last night and, um, she said the similar, the same deal, but I, I just see it differently. Maybe it's just because um, I've seen other things that are going to happen. Mm-hmm. At least I yeah. think they're going to happen. But um, I, I still think it was more of a symbol, like a remember who you are type deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it very well could be, but I guess I'm just I see everything really darkly and pessimistically. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think that's the main topics we sort of wanted to, to hit off of uh, episode two. Is there anything else that anybody wants to sort of follow up with, to end with? I'm good. I hope we get more action next week, please. Yes, yeah, really. yes, that too, because this episode was so slow. Huh. I don't know, you know, I, they have had slow episodes before, but they were always interesting, and it's not like this one wasn't interesting. There was just a little something off that, like, I didn't get my little fill that I needed. My little Game of Thrones it fill. Was, uh, there's too much setup. Yeah. There was not a fun... Yeah, it's too much not setup. Not a lot happened. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, so I guess that will be the end of Episode 2, and we will be back next week talking about Episode 3. See you guys. Hey. Hey.